platform. Chair, we do correct, and we um, may I proceed with the roll call, Chair? Yes, please. Chair, Ms. Muatse, Chair. Good morning, Chairperson, and good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Good morning. Chair, Mr. Mubayani, Chair. Morning, Chairperson. Morning, colleagues. I'm present. Thank you. Chair, Mr. Kaufman, in case it may not be on the platform, but he is on the platform. Mr. Kaufman, Chair. Yes, thank you. Mr. Malamaki, Chair. Morning, everybody. Morning, Chairperson. I'm present. Morning. Chair, Mr. McPherson has some um, connectivity issues, so he's on the platform, Chair. So he asked that I yes. record his presence. Mm, okay. Ms. Ms. Mutahung, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm present. Chair, Mr. Trink, Chair. Uh, Mr. Good morning, Chair. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Chair, Mr. Mulder, Chair. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, all. I'm present. Good morning. Chair, those. So all members coming on the platform, other members may just are still trying to connect chair and we will, I will alert you when they're on the platform chair. Thank you so much. Can we then just flight the agenda for today? Thank you very much. Uh, can we have apologies, sec uh, Secretary? Chair, um, we have no apology as yet, Chair. Um, I would assume the two members not on the platform is trying to link up with us, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, can I have a move and a seconder for the adoption of the agenda? As, is, as it is flighted here. Uh, Honorable Moatse. Thank you, Chair. I move for adoption of the agenda mm -hmm. as tablet. Thank you. Can we have a second for the adoption of the agenda as tabled? Members, we need a second for the adoption of the agenda. Mr. Malamati, Chair. Honorable Malamachi. Thanks, Chair. I stand to second the move. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our agenda has been adopted. So we will then have a continuation. Can I have the agenda back, please? <laughs> Thank you. So we have the continuation of deliberations on the remitted bills, uh, the copyright amendment bill. Um, and then we will have a, the formal consideration of the draft. Can you go down? Of the draft report on the DTIC 2022-23 strategic plan and APP. And then we'll look at some minutes and then hopefully conclude by one o'clock. So as we um, we look at our, our main agenda item, the purpose of us meeting here today is to continue our deliberations, as we said, on the public submissions received in relation to the Copyright Amendment Bill and the DTIC and Advocate van der Merwe's responses in this regard. Um, can we then just check who is, uh, is it Advocate van der Merwe first or, or the department, Dr. Masocha? Um, uh, good morning, Jason. Oh, sorry. It will be at the Kwanda Matter that will lead the, the discussion, Chair, supported by the DTIC. Okay. Chair, and then also just to indicate that Mr. Swaku has joined the meeting. He's on the okay. platform, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Also, then, also just to, as we hand over to Advocate van der Merwe, there has been a few pieces of correspondence 
submitted uh, to the portfolio committee um, that I will circulate to the, port uh, the portfolio committee members that deals with um, this uh, legislation, the Copyright Amendment Bill. And I think Advocate van der Merwe has, has had sight of, of those pieces of correspondence, so she will also speak to it and we'll ask the committee secretary to, to um, disseminate it to members of the committee and then we will deliberate on it when we uh, return for our next discussion on the remitted bills. Over to you, Advocate van der Merwe. Thank good you, Chairperson, and, and good morning to you and good morning to all the members. Um, yes, Chair, in fact, I, I did look at the letters, so uh, perhaps when members consider the letters, um, perhaps just to take into account a, a few things it seems were misunderstood when I presented last week. Um, the first thing that I would like to maybe just quickly address is when it comes to policy decisions. Policy decisions, when we talk about that, it is things like whether to use fair use um, in the bill or whether the copyright regime should remain with fair dealing. That type of decision is a policy decision. On that, our office cannot advise this committee. It is not our mandate to do so. Our mandate is to advise this committee on legal matters, on constitutional matters. And we do not go and look for possible uh, policy decisions that can be taken. That is the role of the department uh, or whoever is the, is the um, owner of the bill. So what we will do is what is before the committee, that policy is what we advise on. And we can look at possible imp uh, implications um, and, and raise that so that the committee is aware of it. But we cannot make, uh, we cannot recommend which decision to take in respect of policy. So that is what I mean when I say that we do not advise on policy. Then there was a statement that I made in respect of a possibility that the committee may decide to reject the bill. Now, this advice that I gave was in respect of the Section 79.1 process. So Joint Rule 203 explains what the committee may and may not do. Committee members will remember that from the start, I've pointed out that a Section 79.1 process is very different from a normal process where, we, where the committee considers and deliberates on a bill. The committee is constrained in what it may and may not do. So a number of submitters requested that the bill be redrafted. Now the bill cannot be redrafted under a section 79.1 process for the simple reason that the whole bill is not open before the committee. There are a number of subsections that the committee cannot at the moment consider because of the limitations of the 79.1 process. But what Joint Rule 203 indicates is that if the committee is of the view that procedurally or substantially the bill is so defective that it cannot be corrected, then the committee may reject the bill. So in other words, when I say the committee cannot redraft the bill because of section 79.1, it may reject the bill. That's the only possible um, solution. It is in, in that regard that I am saying it. So should the committee consider to redraft, it cannot do so if it is so defective that it cannot be, be passed, it should rather be redrafted. Then in this instance, the committee will only have the option to reject the bill. So please, I did not recommend that the bill be rejected. I indicated that if we the committee is of the view that the bill is so defective, then that is the only avenue. It cannot be redrafted. Then, then um, Chair, there was also some, it seems some uh, confusion between the SAYAS process and the impact of amendments. Now, SAYAS is a socioeconomic impact assessment system that was brought into play um, by cabinet. Before that, um, there was a system called regulatory impact assessment. And um, that it, it, it was seen that as to not be as, as um, um, successful, perhaps, I don't know if that's the right word, but it was still something that was run by cabinet um, I think it was also the leader of government business played a role. Um, and what the cabinet decided was that there's now from, um, I think it's 31 August 2015, a requirement 
that any draft bill, and it goes for policy as well, any draft policy and any draft bill that goes to cabinet for approval must undergo a socioeconomic impact assessment um, and, and they must, there must be a certain form. Um, the unit that, that manages the system sits um, within the, um, the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation and they will submit, they will issue a form to confirm that the SAYAS was in fact done and then only can the bill go to cabinet. So, and as far as I'm aware, and in fact, I saw some uh, reports, I think it was submitted to the committee right in the, in the beginning of, of the process, uh, that there was a say as done on, on the bill. Um, I'm aware of one about 2013, 2014 that was done. So it might've been a long time ago, but the fact is there was a social economic impact assessment done on the bill. Now, when we come to amendments, that the committee does. Yes, of course, the committee is, is free to ask for um, some impact to be considered. Um, the committee has done this on, on, on the national credit, but the previous committee of the fifth parliament did this on the national credit amendment bill that it was developing. Um, the committee can ask for an opinion, an external opinion. All of these avenues are, are open, but the normal route when it comes to what would be the implications when we amend a bill in a certain way is to ask the public. If we are not sure, then we, we advertise the clause and we, and we ask the public. And this is normally when we aren't sure is when there's a material amendment. And that is exactly what this committee did. On those issues where there were material amendments that was advertised and there was a response received on what these implications would be. And that is what the committee is now considering, these implications of the amendments. Are they what the committee want? Is that the, the policy direction that the committee want to go into? Is the committee satisfied with the impact, what these, these amendments will have? Um, and because does it address the mischief? Remember, that is why we're doing legislation. The mischief was that there wasn't sufficient balance. Is that, is that what we are addressing? Um, so, so those are just um, maybe a quick explanation, so that it is clear. You know, there, there is some some bit of a difference in a nuance um, when when we consider um, the, the the letters that were done. Chief uh, and members, then on Friday we we, we sent a document where what we did was just to um, list all the amendments that are, that are currently before the committee. So those that were advertised, those that, those that have already been agreed to, those that were not advertised. And um, we also indicated in that document, it, it had some, some it had a table with four columns. We indicated what was the department's recommendation and what was um, um, my office's recommendation or rather response. And what the department and I then did from there, from Friday, was to try and refine the document to assist members a bit more to understand more clearly what, where we are coming from, what is the advice that's being given to the committee. Um, there are areas where we are saying more or less the same thing, we were advising the committee the same. Of course, it's, it's for the committee to decide whether to accept the advice or go with a different uh, decision. But just so that the committee know, this is where, where we, we're getting a similar advice on, on, on this amendment. So, so we've highlighted that. And then where we're definitely giving different advice and where there's still some, some uncertainty. I'm, I'm, I've indicated all of that with green font and I, I will share the document now so that members can see and then I will take you through it. With green font to show where we agree, orange font where there's a bit of uncertainty still and we need to look at some things, red font where we definitely are making different recommendations. But the department and myself are also talking um, outside of, of committee meetings and trying to see what we can do to give the committee more information and perhaps see if there's a way that, that we can find each other to, to offer the committee something that, that might make the decisions a bit easier. Um, I, I think it's a complex bill. I don't think your decisions are going to be very easy, um, but we can do our best. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, it shows me here that I am sharing. I hope that you can see it. And then, um, Chair, just last week, um, I, my, it, it seems uh, something went wrong um, and my video being off helped a bit. So I'm going to turn my video off because I think it's not really necessary for my face to be there. The document is more important. Um, if there is, is a problem, then just shout and I will, I will attend to that or I can start my video again. So 
Members, the first amendment that we're looking at, um, so I've um, the, the, the document is clause by clause, because this is now, we, we need to get into that, that mode. We are, we are busy amending the bill, so it will happen clause by clause. So, so I've reworded it in that, in, in that format rather than by themes. So the first clause, we, we, there's a number of amendments proposed, either amendments or additions in respect of definitions. And in respect of accessible, accessible format copy, now this is in respect of uh, persons with a disability, um, there was a proposal to add including two. It wasn't advertised, but we did take into consideration what the public said. And both the department and my office um, proposed that the wording of including two be retained. In respect of the definition of authorized entity, this one was in fact advertised and it also relates to persons with a disability. And both our recommendation is that the wording as was advertised uh, be retained. I looked again, I, I suggested last week that we add as prescribed, but I looked at the wording again um, and I'm satisfied that, that even without the wording as prescribed, uh, the definition is sufficient. The regulations will apply once they are there, they will give an indication of what is authorized. And um, in respect of nonprofit companies, it's very clear from the definition which nonprofit companies are in fact um, um, considered here. And then in respect of broadcast, um, here in the end, the department and I agree. I, I um, recommended a couple of options, but one of the options are exactly um, compatible. So what we recommend in the end, is first off that the, the word wire, uh, members will remember that there was a proposal to remove wire from both bills, performance protection and copyright definition of broadcast, but both um, in both bills, the recommendation is for that to in fact be retained. And then the recommendation further is for the wording as advertised to be retained. In other words, that the definition in the copyright amendment bill be aligned with that in the performance amendment bill um, and that, that that is the, the, the definition that, that is retained. So yes, we understand that this will not exactly be Electronic Communications Act, but that policy is still being developed and the committee can't just wait for, you know, that might be years and years before that definition is, is, is um, finalized. So at this point in time, the definition will be aligned between the two, two bills. Once the bills are passed between the two acts, of course, and um, at least that will give some um, consistency in, 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 in um, uh, intellectual property law, at least between copyright and performance protection. Then in respect of lawfully acquired, this definition was in respect of uh, private copies. And the, the big concern here was that it, that it almost made it impossible to make a, a private copy. And the, the recommendation from both the department and myself is that the definition of lawfully acquired rather be removed and also in the text of the bill where that was proposed to be added, that, that it be removed there. The argument is that this is something where the courts can make, it, make a decision. It is, it is something that has been there for years and years. Um, there is already some uh, you know, precedent on, on what is accepted, what is not accepted. Um, so that is the recommendation there. In respect of technological protection measure, here the department and I are making different um, uh, recommendations, and it's something that that we are still looking at. We're doing some further research so that we can give the committee um, proper information to, to make to make a good decision. Um, the the concern here is how to balance two aspects. So technological protection measures, and I mean it's it's, it's probably part of the most complex areas in in copyright because it, it deals with technology and, it, and it's such a, um, you know, such a fine line that we need to, to cover here between providing sufficient protection to the person who developed the technology and is now trying to protect their intellectual property in this technology and someone who wants to use the, the, the product that they bought and want to be able to use it to the best of, of their, their ability. And the, for instance, the, the concerns that I raised was that you might have a situation where you can only 
use the dealer that sold you the car because no one else can access the computer because they can't bypass the, the technological protection measure. So there might be some consumer impact if it is too strict. Um, but on the other hand, there's also concern about loopholes. So it is a very difficult question. And like I say, we, we, are, we are still trying to do uh, a lot of research on this and trying to see what we can recommend to the committee. Um, and of course, in the end, it's going to be for the, to the, the committee to make a decision whether it will be a more strict acceptance of, of, of technological protection measure or if it will be less strict, but in order to, to create that balance and ensure that uh, the consumer can still make use of, of um, the technology uh, without being so restricted that it almost becomes um, impossible to maintain uh, the, the, the product. The same argument is on the um, circumvention device, so I won't go into that, it, it, it covers both. Then chair the next clauses, clauses five, seven, and nine, these deals with retrospective matters. Committee has already um, agreed to this. It was uh, one uh, of the referrals from, uh, in fact, two referrals from, from the presidency in respect of retrospective clauses and delegations to the minister that was, con the concern was that they were too broad. And the, it was already um, decided by the committee that these will be deleted. What is also added in clause seven is this aspect of gender neutral drafting which was also a decision taken by the committee. So I've just added it so that we know exactly in each clause what are the amendments proposed. And then there's a new clause proposed, and this will be in respect of the amendments to sections 11A and 11B. And all that it is really is to just align the act um, so that all these rights um, have the same um, extent. Uh, so when we did when we did the bill, we, we did this in respect of works and so on, but not in respect of published editions and computer programs. So this inclusion was just to make sure that all the rights have the same extent of, um, of, of um, description. So there was a concern about um, whether it should be service or services, but um, I, we, I discussed with the department and, and they agree that the error was in, in the, the, the document that was published, not in the act. So there's no um, amendment required here. The wording as advertised is what we recommend be included in the bill. In clause 11, again, just some gender neutral drafting that the committee already decided on. Then clause 13, and here we deal with section uh, 12A. 12A is our general fair use um, clause. And the proposal was before to, re, re, um, to delete certain paragraphs because they were duplicated, but it was pointed out that no, in fact, these are very important examples because it gives you the extent of, of fair use, it, 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 it provides guidance. So from both the department and my office, the, the recommendation is to not delete those paragraphs, but to retain them. And then there's a couple of things that will now be more or less the same. So I will explain it in the first instance and then just refer back and, and move faster through, through where it appears again. So uh, in a 12a uh, paragraph C, the, um, uh, the proposal was that you only need to um, mention the name of the author if it appears on the work. Now this wasn't part of C and it was proposed that it be included. So we, uh, from both our offices, the proposal is for this, in fact, to be included. In other words, it makes it just clear. You must mention the name of the author if it appears on the work that you are using. So this, this removes that, that issue of whether, um, you know, how can I mention the name of the author if I don't know who it is? So it just clarifies that. And then there was a requirement, uh, or a request rather, that you should only mention the name of the author when, when it's possible to do so, when, they, when it's practically, you know, you're able to do so. And the example was given of, you know, if you've got like 50 photos in a collage, you know, how do you do this? Um, and from, from our office, we say, you know, we need to maybe perhaps look at each of these. Um, the department is saying, yes, we, we agree. We need to make sure that there's a balance. So we need to go and look a bit further um, but we also discussed, and, and, and you know, what we must also keep in mind is, so you have this collage of 50 photos, is there anything that stops you from having a footnote to say, you know, these are the, 
the authors of the of the 50 photos uh, because what we are trying to protect here is the moral rights of the of the authors um so is it is it really impossible um, every time or is it just difficult so so those are still things that that um the department and myself we, we are grappling a bit and and we will do some more research and we'll try and give the the, the, the uh, committee more information so you can make a good decision paragraph 12d in section 12a what happened here was that there was a request that, um, and maybe uh, if I over explain, I do apologize, um, but, it, but it is a complex bill. And um, what we have in our bill is we've got a fair use clause, 12A, and then we have a number of specific exceptions. So it's a hybrid system. So th that is the system that the bill proposes. And what the concern was that these exceptions are then not expressly subject to fair use. So the proposal was, well, then let's make them subject to fair use because all of this is part of the fair use system. But the consequence was that you can't just take fair use or those principles of fair use and just, you know, prop them onto each of these specific exceptions because some of these exceptions are in their own nature, very different. And they can't just easily comply with the general fair use principles. That is why they are in sections of their own. So we realized that, that by doing a blanket application of fair use to all of these exceptions, you are actually complicating things to such an extent that you might be nullifying these specific exceptions. So from both our sides, the proposal is to rather delete this proposed subsection D, uh, paragraph D, that would make fair use applicable to all the, the uh, exceptions. What we would rather recommend is that each of the specific exceptions be considered by themselves and to make sure that the use that is allowed is fair. In other words, not just a general blanket, but that you, you apply specific um, criteria that is that can be applied and is applicable to the specific exception that you are working with. Then there is um, the, the, this is the, the other the other aspect that that will will come up quite regularly, and uh, okay, uh, this is is sorry, is someone speaking? No, um, this is the other aspect that will come up uh, quite regularly: the issue of fair practice and extent justified by the purpose, and. Um, what we had was that the bill spoke of extent justified by the purpose. There was a request to add fair practice. Then that was advertised. Oh, sorry, this wasn't advertised, but people commented and we did look at the comments. And what was pointed out is that there is in fact a difference between fair practice and extent justified by the purpose. Fair practice refers to almost industry practices um, and extent justified by the purpose would be specific, the purpose before you. And, and whether whether it is it is fair what you are doing with the, with the work that you are using in respect of that purpose. And then when we look at the treaties, it seems that both of these are used in respect of quotations and education and extent justified by the purposes used in respect of others. So we the, between the department and myself, we are still doing some more research on this to make sure that we, we have a, a, a good picture and, and that we can then present it to the committee. The next aspect on quotations, I'm not going to go into this. It's again that as aspect of whether it is practical to list the names of the authors. 12B1B was in respect of illustrations for teaching. Now there was a proposal to move this to section 12D, which deals with education as it is the same, deals with the same topic, so to speak. So both the department and our office is recommending that it in fact so be moved there. Then um, the ephemeral rights aspect. Now, this is the, the Canadian um, Act that we looked at. And um, what we did was using the wording of the Canadian Act resulted in some um, things that weren't, for, were, well, I suppose, uh, you know, if, uh, using wording from another, from another country, the exact wording from another country, you, you need to understand that, that you, you need to be careful how you insert it. And what was pointed out by, by the submissions were that um, some of the, the terminology used will have to have to change, but also some of this the infrastructure 
that is available in Canada is not yet available in South Africa. So you have a little bit of a, of a disjoint, um, disjointed um, implementation. And because of this, uh, both the department and myself are recommending that we rather revert to the wording of the bill prior to the advert. Um, because at this point in time, uh, without making sure that that infrastructure is first there, the, the necessary uh, collective societies and so on, um, then, then, then the, the wording might just be problematic. In respect of um, 12B2D, the name of the author, um, if it appears on the work, I've already spoken to that. Practicable, again, I've already spoken to that about how if it's you know, practical to, to uh, mention the name of the author. The same in respect of um, 12B1E, again, the name of the author. 12B1E1, is uh, it was its proposal to delete this because it was a duplication that was uh, agreed by, to by the committee before. Um, substituting extent justified by the purpose with fair practice in E2. Um, I've already spoken to that, um, you know, which, which one should be retained. Um, and then E3, that was just a drafting thing to, to just make sure that the, the, the paragraphs read well. Um, again, 12B1E3, extent justified by the purpose and fair practice. I've already spoken to that. It's the same principle that applies here. Um, just changing the wording in the translations paragraph instead of talking about non-commercial purposes to talk about not for commercial purposes, just for clarity, that has already been um, uh, 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 referred to. Adding language and culture as a reason for translation. Apologies, this should be green. Um, we are uh, recommending the same thing, that the wording as it is amended, in other words, the inclusion of furtherance of language and culture as a reason for translation to, 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 be, re to be retained. Then again, extend justified by the purpose and fair practice that I have spoken to. There was also a concern about the or that was at the last paragraph, but this is simply a drafting convention. Now, when we do a list, um, each of those, those paragraphs, if the, the second last paragraph is joined to the last paragraph by the word or, it means each of those paragraphs stand separately by themselves. If it is joined by an and, it means all the, the, the paragraphs listed must be read together. So in other words, if we say when you apply for a visa, you must bring your ID, you must bring your passport, and you must bring a letter, a proof of residence. It means you must bring all three the documents. So that is what the and uh, indicates. If it says all, it means that you could bring one of the three documents. So the recommendation is for the all to be retained as it's only one of the, the paragraphs here that would be applicable. Then in respect of um, impersonal copies, changing individual with natural person, that was already agreed to by the committee. It is just to make it clear that this is not a company that can make personal copies or private copies. Then the lawfully acquired, I've already spoken to this. This is one of the areas where lawfully acquired was added. The recommendation is that it rather be removed and left to the courts. And there is already, as there's already a lot of precedent, it is not something new. It is something that's established in our law. Then um, the, the aspects of um, um, requirements in respect of different times and devices. So the recommendation is that we retain the paragraphs in section 12A. So what happened was, uh, members will recall, I said there were, was a recommendation to delete some of the paragraphs in 12A. And in order to make sure that everything is covered, some of that wording was moved here. But if we retain 12A's wording, then it can be removed here. It doesn't have to be uh, stated twice. The aspect, again, of um, owned by a natural person, again, if it is reverting to 12A, it can be removed here. The next aspect is again personal copies, um, fair practice versus extent justified by the purpose. Um, and again, like I say, we are still looking at this, making sure that we're giving you, you very good advice on this, um, which of the two should, should be retained. Ephemeral rights, I've already, already spoken to that. This is the aspect of the Canadian Act's wording. And this subsection here is just uh, flowing from the, 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 the previous discussion. It's a consequential amendment. 
So um, the recommendation before that we rather retain the wording of the bill um, as before the advert will then also impact here and the subsection will then be deleted. Um, subsection 12B3B, this again deals with personal copies. And as I said before, the proposal is that lawfully acquired be removed. And then what this um, paragraph did was to say that these factors only apply to personal copies because we were a bit concerned that the addition of lawfully acquired might make it very strict. So if we take the wording lawfully acquired away, then that strictness fall away. There's more discretion. We fall back on, on um, more or less how things are at the moment. And then it is not necessary to have this, um, this specific uh, exclusion. Section 12C, so we're moving on to the next section. Um, this was just correcting the layout of the section and the recommendation is that it in fact be corrected so that the error um, is no longer there. Then 12C2, there was a proposal for the three-step test to be included, but um, the concern was raised that you are in fact, um, by doing that, you are layering the, the, the requirements and making it very difficult for people to actually make use of the exceptions. And in any event, treaty wording is not intended to be taken from the treaty and included in your legislation. It's more intended as a guide. And uh, so both, both the department and my office is recommending that um, it, be, it be removed. Then in 12D1, here there was an issue of fair practice to be removed as it's, it is already addressed in 12D8. And we both agree that because it's a duplication in 12D1, it can be removed there. The same thing in respect of 12D1, in, in respect of adding the three-step test, um, the recommendation is that it be removed from, from both our offices. The next one, 12D8A, this is again that aspect of practicality, whether it's practical to mention the name of the author. And like I said, we are still... Uh, doing a little bit more research on this so that we can give the committee proper advice on this. The next 12D8, this is just if the author's name appears on the work, then it must be mentioned. That has already been agreed to by the committee. The next aspect 12D8 is about the extent justified by the purpose versus fair practice. I've already discussed that. Uh, the same principles apply here. And then again, in respect of practicality, 12D9, the same issues um, apply here. And in 12D9, also the issue of fair practice and extent justified by the purpose, again, apply here. Then in 12D9, again, um, what we had here was that the name had to be mentioned if it appeared in or on the work. And the proposal was to delete the word uh, in because the alignment between the rest of the, the sections in the building um, it would be better as the rest all only refer to on the work. Gender neutral drafting in clause 19, that has already been discussed. And then in 19C4, um, here we had the, the concern that because there was a duplication with 19C1, there was a proposal that the aspect of commercial copies be, um, be deleted. But what we did was to only re um, remove the word commercial and the result was then that you limited all copies because you either have them for commercial purposes or for non-commercial purposes. And um, the intention is not to limit all copies. There are other restrictions for applying to copies. So um, the pr proposal from both the department and our office is that the word commercial rather just be retained in that um, subsection. Then when we go to se section 19D, this is the one that deals with persons with a disability. There was a proposal to delete um, as prescribed when we refer to specific persons because of the inclusion of the phrase authorized entity. But it was pointed out that you might have authorized entities and other persons as prescribed. Um, so in other words, we, we actually took that way, uh, away inadvertently. And the proposal is that prescribed as prescribed rather be retained and not removed because there may be a different category from authorized entities. Then there was also just a, a grammar issue of uh, changing uh, persons that to person who, and we uh, both the department and our office um, proposed that that be, um, be, be in fact uh, the, the way to go. Then in respect of uh, 19D1B, 
what we did here was uh, the wording was there, but it was a bit unclear. And the proposal was um, to rather make it, bring it a bit closer to the treaty wording. So it was just a, a bit of an editing. And um, that, that was already agreed to by the committee. Then 19D subsection two, including authorized entity. Um, and the paragraph was just adjusted because she now added that this word, it no longer read well. So we just uh, proposed some adjustment that has already been agreed to by the committee. Then there was um, a, a concern in respect of how 19D3 was reworded. And um, first off, the, in A, there's not a concern. The, the concern was mostly in B and then in, in subsection four. And the concern was that the treaty language spoke to a defense. And the concern that, that my office had with that is that you can't, you can't draft for a defense if you don't give the obligation. So it was a bit of a challenge, but we, we have made a proposal for how it could read. Um, just want to see where I can find it here. A person may not export or import where such person know or has reasonable grounds to believe that the accessible format copy will be used for purposes other than to aid persons with a disability. So the concern was, um, you know, because of, of, of the defense, um, the person did not know that it would have been used for something else. And, and it, it's a bit difficult to, to put that tense into legislation because it's almost a past perfect or future perfect or something like that. Um, it, it is a bit difficult, but if there is still discomfort, uh, then of course we can add something with the defense added to this. And both the department and my office propose that we, we reword this, um, uh, this subsection or par paragraph of subsection three to make it clear um, what, you know, it is not to put an obligation that you need to go and do research and find out who will use this. It is to, to say that if you suspected that someone was going to use this um, in, in a cinema, for instance, that is not for, for the disabled, well, then you should not be importing it. Um, and, and that is what the purpose is. So the proposal is that we relook at the wording and come up with something that is definitely more um, aligned with, with the treaty. The next aspect is 19D4A, and um, this, this is again the issue of practicality, whether it is practical to mention the name, and we will still be looking into that a bit more. The, the next one is um, 19D4B, and it's against this, the same issue, was that um, you know it's, you, you are limiting it because you might not be importing or exporting for persons um, it, the way it was worded meant that only a person with a disability, you, you, may not, you may not import it for someone who is assisting a person with a disability, but also it already is, is, is repeating to some extent what is said in three sub in paragraph B. So the proposal from, from both the department and our office is that this rather be deleted, it's already in the bill, and it just causes confusion. Then there's also some gender neutral drafting in this clause and also in clauses 21, 23, 24 and 25. And um, so those are really just technical amendments that the committee has already decided on. Clause 27 deals with offences. And it, it's a difficult one um, because with offences, we need to keep in mind that this is this is something serious. You know what we what we write down here um, affects, on the one hand, industry if it's not um, uh, sufficient, and on the other hand, it might affect a user who who might not have intended any harm um, if it is too strict. <clears throat> so there needs to be a balance. So first of all, there's just um, a, a change, as I explained before, the difference between or and and. We had and, it shouldn't be both of the paragraphs. So the proposal is just to make it an or, just to, to, to correct that. Then there was a concern that um, you can't just say authority of the owner. What if the owner is a company and the company delegates this to the, the chief financial officer, chief financial officer authorizes, then it's not, you know, there might be an argument 
that it wasn't the actual owner who gave that that authority. Um, and so, so the proposal is then to take away the wording of the owner and just say necessary authority. In other words, what is required is proper authority. So from, from both the department and, and our office, that is what we propose. Then there was a proposal to remove the word commercial. So what this would result in is any person who then uses this um, the word in, 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 in um, contravention of this offence, whether the purpose was for commercial purposes or for non-commercial purposes, and others maybe for personal use, um, both those types of uses would constitute an offence if you remove the word commercial. Now, this is a policy decision for the for for uh, the committee to decide on. The question is, what what do we want? Do we want both uses to be criminalised? Um, what from from my side, what I can say to the committee is just to, we must just be aware. Um, this this offence carries a, a five year possible sentence. Um, so so it's it, the, the the reason you create an offence is something is so serious and has such a serious effect on what you're trying to achieve, that you need to make it an offence in order to make it a deterrent. And the question then is, do, do we say that maybe use for personal uh, um, contravention of this but for, for personal use um, is still having such an effect? So that is the question that, that must be answered here. And you will see that, that from, um, from the department side and my side, we are making different recommendations. The department is proposing that both commercial and non-commercial purposes be made an offence. Our office is saying, if you look at the serious sanction that's being imposed, there's a jail sentence involved, that the committee carefully considers um, if non-commercial infringement should not perhaps just be a civil infringement. In other words, there will be a civil claim uh, for damages. But like I say, this, this, is, a, this is, is a policy decision. It's about what do we want to achieve in the end. Then there was a recommendation that when we look at offences, there should be an element of knowing that you're dealing with infringing copies and both the department and our office um, is recommending that this be included. And the rationale of course for this is that um, to, to have someone who is not aware uh, and, and could not have known that they're dealing with, inf uh, with an infringing copy, for that person to be guilty of an offence, um, you know, it, it's almost a strict liability uh, which which um, I doubt would would um, pass constitutional muster. The next question, so the first question, of course, was the commercial versus the non-commercial. Second question on, on offences, and it implies, I think, for, for all the offences, this one, is whether negligence should be included as, as an offence. And when we look at, at negligence, so, so intent would be, um, and I explained it to the department yesterday, and, and I hope the explanation is, is, is something that will make it clear, if you, you, you're going out in the rain, you've got your rain boots on, you've got your umbrella, and you see that there's a nice big area that is very muddy, and it's your intent to muddy your boots, then you take your, your steps and you walk into that muddy area. That is what we deal with with intent. Um, or, and, it, and it's very basic. I mean, it, it can go much broader. But the intention is, this is what I want to do. I want to make my boots muddy. That is intention. Negligence would be... You go out into the rain, you've got your nice new boots on, and you know that there's a bit of a puddle there, um, you're going to avoid it, it's never your intention to walk into it, but someone behind you calls your name, and you reverse a little bit because you, you can't see what nicely who it is, and you step into the puddle. So, so that would be negligence. In other words, you never intended to do this, um, you, you tried your best to avoid it, but because of something that happened, you did it anyway. So the question then is, whether negligence should be included as part of this offence. It can be. It's not that it's not, not allowed. Again, it is just about what we, what we want to achieve with this offence. What is it that we want to guard against? So again, um, it is orange because we are still, we're not 100% sure. It, you know, it, it, there's a bit of discomfort, but we will still uh, look into this a bit more. Then there was just also an issue on paragraphs. Um, and just correcting it, and again, it was just the document that was advertised that was incorrect. It will be corrected, and both the department and myself uh, recommend that that be um, uh, corrected. 
Then in respect of 5B, the same issue of negligence versus intent, whether both should be part of the offence. Um, subsection 5C, the third offence, there was just a, a proposal in respect of correcting verbs. We both of it, um, uh, both apart and myself uh, agree the verb should be corrected. And then we both uh, propose that if the, there should be knowledge that you're dealing with in infringing, you shouldn't be innocent of this and, and commit an offence. Clause 29. Now, Clause 29 is the other side of the coin of Section 27. Section 27 gives us the offences. Clause 29, Sections 28, O, P, and S deals with the obligations that the bill places. So what we do in 27, we must do in 28 and, and vice versa. So the same issue comes up here respect, in respect of negligence. Now, just to add perhaps here, there was, a, there was a concern about whether we should have reason to know versus reason to believe. And if the committee decides that negligence should be part of the offence, it would be my recommendation that the wording is reason to know. Because what we're dealing with with an offence is you need to do what we're setting out in, in our offence clause in section 27 are the elements of the offence. So this is what the state must prove. Now, reason to know is a well-known negligence test. What happens is the state must simply prove that the reasonable man would have known. Um, so, so if it is something that was top secret and the reasonable man would not have known, then it would not be negligence. If it is something that um, every second person that you ask will say, yes, of course, yes, this is how it is. Well, then the reasonable person would have known. So that is all that the state has to prove. But when it comes to, to reasons to believe, um, we, we don't have a test for that. Um, I'm a bit concerned about what that would mean for, for the state to prove. Um, because if we say that the reasonable man would have known, um, well, what would the reasonable man have, been, have believed? Uh, you know, it suddenly becomes a bit more subjective and, and a bit more difficult for the state to prove. So I would really recommend if the committee decides to include negligence, that we, that we go with, with wording that is tested, tried, um, it is clear what the offence is, because we need to also keep in mind if our offence is not clear, then it becomes unconstitutional or, or, or might be attacked constitutionally because a person needs to know when they will be transgressing the law. Um, and, and, you know, I might say, oh, I had reason to believe this, or I didn't have reason to believe this, um, and the next person might say different. So, so we need to just keep that in mind. Um, but, of course, this only comes into play if the committee decides that negligence is part of the offence. If the committee says no, the offence must only be intent, then we can go back to reasons to believe. Because then it's then then there's not that that problem in respect of an offence and and proving it. Then there was also in sections 28O and P removing the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act because this has been repealed, um, and that the committee has already agreed to adding a reference in 28P to regulations under the Act that the committee has already agreed to. 28 is the same issue of. Um, reason to believe versus um, um, reasonably should have known. So I've already discussed that, the same issue here. Then there's also some gender neutral drafting to be done here. And clause 31, there's correcting of subsection numbering. It has already been agreed, it's just a technical um, amendment. Gender neutral drafting, that's already been agreed to. Clause 33, that there was a correction of a cross-reference. The committee has already agreed to that. Um, then recognizing regulations, recognizing um, entities in respect of persons with a disability. There were some um, proposals um, in respect of changing the paragraph numbers, but I think it might just have been someone who misread what was there. It was in fact CI, not CL. Um, so it was already the capital CI. Um, I think I is a bit of a difficult one because, yeah, it does look like a, a small letter L. But if you look at the, uh, the way it goes, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, you know that you are dealing with I and not, not um, with L. 
The 393 is just a consequential amendment to include your, your regulations in subsection 2, and that has already been agreed to by the committee. Clause 35 is then in respect of gender neutral drafting, already agreed to by the committee. Then, in respect of the performance protection, now this was not advertised because there was nothing new, but I'll just also quickly go through this. There was a proposal for amending the definition of broadcast to exclude wire. But the recommendation is, of course, to include that. Then in clause two, gender neutral drafting already agreed to by the committee. Clause three was distinguishing between audiovisual works and sound recordings when it comes to which receives royalties and which equitable remuneration or both. Committee already agreed to that. Also some gender neutral drafting, the same in clauses four and five. Um, in clause six, um, section 8D, there was just a word missing, the word into. Committee already agreed to that. Clause seven, I think there's two of these, removing the reference again to Electronic Communications and Transactions Act. Committee has already agreed to that, and then some gender neutral drafting. So Chair remembers this, this is the kind of a combination of the, 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 the two presentations um, to bring everything together for you in, in one place. Um, and um, I hope that that was of assistance to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Advocate van der Merwe. I think the table helps greatly. Can I just check with Dr. Masoja on behalf of the department if she wants to make any input on that presentation? Morning, Chair, and uh, good morning, honorable members, uh, advocates. Good morning. In terms of the um, the table and the issues dis uh, uh, discussed by the advocate, we have uh, looked at them collectively, and uh, they are in line with our discussions, Chair, and there's nothing to add. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, members, and I open it up for de further deliberations. I will take your hands. Honorable Malamecha and Honorable Thring. Honorable uh, Malamecha. No, thanks, Chair. Allow me to open my notes. <clears throat> uh, I, I think, Comrade Chair, to be on the safe side, as alluded by advocate that this is a complex matter, it will be very much appreciated that it be simplified that even a layman can be able to understand it. But if it be complex to the academic, what about the layman? It's something that we must not take lightly because it's like if I have to go this route, Comrade Chair. You want the public to have an understanding of this context, but you don't want to accept that South Africa is not a learned country. And apartheid has played a major role where people of certain color were denied education, so to understand a number of things, but you still want to continue writing things that bind them in that particular language, to be specific. None of these binding regulations are written in vernacular. Yet we want the vernac, which is meant for them to understand that. And to make things worse, we apply terms which are not in an ordinary Oxford dictionary terms that need encyclopedia to understand them, Comrade uh, Chair. I'm saying that after the, after advocate herself confessed this is a complex matter. And uh, there is this simple English from a distance, but the meaning is deeper. Unfair practice, the usage of or, 
or if it has to be said or 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 is bad but there's when you go down there there's somewhere where it says the usage of or versus and once you say you come with id or license it means one of the two but if or it has to be complemented by and it means it must be this and this one so jefferson i'm very much disturbed that the language itself meant to be understand by the those who didn't go to school is still going deep otherwise i will recommend to say consider to simplify it if not the the, the very thing the neck will do for me and the advocate was very clear to put us where we belong to say in terms of the August 2015 social impact bill. And it says clear who must say what when before it goes to the cabinet. These are the things that we must get. And it also further says who takes decisions. And I was also clear to hear that once it becomes a public consumption, then who are we to say? We take decision on that. But I'm saying before going there, it will be very much appreciated that the two of us, including the committee, when I say the two of us, them as the entity, we go to the committee, to the public, so that when we come back from the, uh, the public, we are saying this is what the public says. And this is what we've contributed towards the public. To be fair, we endorse what the public has said. Chair, let me pause there for now. Thank you, Honorable Malami Chair. Um, Honorable Thring. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. I think mine are just a, just a few uh, comments. Um, the first was with regards to the uh, the CS that Advocate Van der Marva mentioned, and I think she indicated that it could have been done in 2013, 2014. Um, however, that social impact assessment may well be outdated. Um, and I think that the committee would, uh, again, and my recommendation is that we need to, to really consider uh, whether we needed to have actually a, uh, an updated social impact assessment done uh, with, regards to, with regards to the bill. Um, then also, and I just unfortunately just can't find the place, but during the presentation there was uh, to the extent, um, but uh, it was extend uh, uh, with the D and not, not a T at the end, and I just can't find that particular place, but I'll see if I can find it um, and, and uh, just, just to bring that correction. Um, I also noticed then uh, there's there's been a few aspects where the advocate has indicated that there's uh, still more work that has to be done. Uh, and I can identify at least three. Um, one is with regards to the use of fair practice uh, versus uh, the extent justified by purpose. Um, and the advocate indicated that uh, there's still more work that needs to be done uh, and then referred back to the committee. The second way she mentioned that there was still more work that needed to be done uh, so that they could actually properly advise the committee was uh, on the aspect of um, practicality. And then the third is, is where she's the conclu almost concluding was the aspect of offense um, with respect to negligence and intent. And so I think that um, with regards to those comments made by the advocate we would, I would appreciate it whether uh, I would appreciate it if that particular research and advice where more research needs to be done is actually done and then brought to the committee uh, so that we can deliberate on that. Uh, Chair, I think also clearly um, 
there is a huge amount of uh, interest in this particular bill. Um, we we clearly have to look at trying to balance the, the the aspect of how do we ensure that we don't put barriers, for example, to our universities, our our schools, uh, to those who have disabilities, um, versus the the um, uh, the aspect where those who are the originators of um, of work. Are fairly compensated, um, and so there's a huge amount of of interest in this. And I think that as a committee, uh, we clearly need to be able to really apply our minds so that there's no prejudice either to the originators of the work, and neither is there prejudice uh, to to those who perhaps are less privileged uh, and not in the place where uh, they are able to in advance their education. Uh, because of onerous regulations that are that are in place, so clearly I think that it's a it's a difficult, complex uh, bill that we that we need to uh, to apply ourselves to. And uh, my view is that there's still much more work that needs to go into it. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honourable Singh, Honourable Mbuyani. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Chairperson, for the opportunity. Uh, mine is just some few clarity-seeking questions, because earlier on I hear the advocate uh, indicating in terms of the uh, CRs that was done, and also in terms of material uh, amendments uh, that we advertise on specific laws, and the input uh, on that regard as well. But then the issue of fair use, fair dealing, and now there's a new word, fair practice. I'll, 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 I'll need some clarity here. What, what are the difference between these two, uh, three issues now, fair use, fair dealing, and now this fair, uh, fair uh, practice. And also maybe I'll, I'll, I'll request the advocate in terms of whether are we not backtracking again to say we're going back, uh, we need, need to make more research on, on the matters uh, while we were given some ample time to deal with this. Uh, the, it's proper in that we, we, we go back, uh, while well, we're not finished yet, or we still need more time in dealing with. As the latter speaker just indicated, the pastor that we need to make up our minds and really deal with this matter. I don't know whether the is also the issue of importing provisions uh, from Canadian uh, provisions here, yeah. the issue, because the stakeholders wanted uh, to reduce the infernal uh, period from 60 days uh, to 30 days in line with the rest of the world. What, what is the view of the, of the advocate in terms of the, of, of the 60 days? Also, maybe the last one, the issue of the, uh, the three-step test, uh, it should be included to balance the introduction of the fair use vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the fair dealing. I'm not so sure whether we're still in line with those six reservations of the president, or now we're opening up uh, the bill uh, for members just to get there uh, and put more on the issues of, of, of the bill. Maybe the last one also, Chair, the wireless versus the, the wire, because now, yes, we are transforming. It's a the period of transition, but we also need the wireless. We also need the, the, the wire uh, that we usually uh, are assisting us in terms of the communication and so forth. Now, let me just get the uh, uh, pause there for now, but we'll come back, uh, Chair, because I'm happy if the EIA was done, and does it talk to the current uh, input of the amendment that was just done now? So that will be my, my, my question. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Mbiani, Honorable Nswaku. Morning, Chair. Morning. Yes. Um, no, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, mine, of course, uh, uh, 
couple of questions on my side. Um, yeah, indeed, there is a huge interest on, on this bill. Um, and also, I know as a new member, I'm trying to actually to, to really get around it. Um, of course, uh, need me a bit of more time, but it's fine. I'm actually getting there. Uh, I think that uh, I shared the sentiments to saying that I think that um, it, 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 it must actually read very easily. It's not the first time that I... I am actually part and parcel of the people drafting a bill. I was part with the drafting of the electoral bill. I think that you could, the phrases that we use were very simple, simple uh, 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 language that you're able to really understand. And there was no ambiguity, you know, and all kind of stuff like that. So I would have even checked in terms of the advocate there that could you not use you not know, very high technical a uh, language that will be very understood by the layman's person because they say even the most difficult thing you must be able to um it must be able to be understood by a seven year old um i looked as if there have been more changes that were done um i mean as the bill was actually started from the way back I appreciate the table. I think now it's starting to, to say what has been done, what has been approved or not. I think that we should uh, have a look at this thing, uh, uh, Chair, that we must start to have what is called a resolution tracker to track all resolutions that are done. Maybe that's probably for this committee, for, for this uh, uh, item alone, for all the other items into, into our the meetings. Uh, at least now this has made easy that this was done adopted this was what happening like that but what is actually missing now is the deadlines because we cannot have something circulating and circulating and circulating i'm hearing this thing has been running for four years plus something like like that i'm, I'm stand i stand to be you know i stand i stand to be corrected and uh, for myself to to have something running run all the time it's irritating it gets boring i'm a gemini and i think gemini is a, a nature that they don't like uh, something that is very you know, you, we do the same thing over and over again. So I'll suggest that let's have a resolution tracker of this with the timelines, deadlines. People must commit in terms of if necessary, because I'm even hearing that there are clauses that needs to be still to be in, investigated. Up until when? We must have a deadline by next week. This clause will be done. We are one. So let us let us have something of, of, of that nature, Chair, with, the, with this uh, table or, or resolution or with a resolution tracker. Let us have timelines, a deadline. By this time, it will be done. And I wanted to also uh, check, Chair, that uh, I've read the president's uh, issues when with this bill. My question would be to say, I've, I've, I've seen some of them have been covered. Has the constitutionality now of the bill been addressed, or this is what we're actually trying to address? Have we looked in terms of the, res the reservation that the, you know, that the president had in terms of this bill, have they been addressed uh, in, 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 in terms of that? I think I was chair just as a, a comment as I'm reading through the, the whole bill, is that our, our position will be to only say that Uti, this bill must not uh, be able, it must not actually exploit the creative industries. You know, so when they create the, the people who are creating content and the performers, because historically, you'll find that people have been uh, exploited uh, in terms of their original work being taken by the recording, you know, by the recording, you know, the you know the companies. So my perspective or, or the or the the perspective of the EFF will be to ensure that there's no exploitation of the person who's creating or, or the originator, exploited by the multi, uh, you know, by 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 the multinational, you know, the companies. So that that's what actually I'm looking at. I think as I'm going because I'm reading the appeal. I think maybe uh, I don't know. Chair will allow us to maybe to maybe you know you know the you know the you know the the, the submissions as the political party a, a return one you know, for the consideration at least uh, by the committee. And then also on the other point, the the last one is this informal rights. Is there maybe why are we using such complex terms when like you know the whole jargon? Are we not able to to look at the word that uh, we're able you know? a more practical and a simpler way 
you know, uh, do we really have intellectual, are we, I'm looking for the word, don't we have any capacity, intellectual capacity, to really develop our own wedding? Why do we have to import something from Canada? What if also that is actually, that can, we, it can deal with us in terms of the copyright because you are stealing someone's wedding and you're putting it onto the bill. I mean, I've never actually had that. You know, why can't we use our own wedding and develop it? Don't we have a capacity, you know, to actually, uh, 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 you know, to be able, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, to do those, those, those kind of things. So let us look in, into that, uh, I think maybe we might have to, you know, have a, a bit of time to get into the, this thing. Maybe we might need a bit of time to, you know, more deliberations. But I, I welcome it in terms of the, this opportunity that we're given also as a new entrance so that we're able to just get up to speed. Those are my two cents worth contribution, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Twaku. Honorable um, McPherson. Um, thanks so much. Um, so, sorry, I just want to just find my notes here. Um, so I think that it's, a, it's it seems to have taken a, a bit of an interesting turn um, from from when we first uh, deliberated uh, about this, um, and 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 I'm still not convinced that that the bill is headed in the right direction. is well drafted. I think it's a it's a patch. It's becoming a patchwork now. Um, and, you know, I think that we are so far down the road in trying to pull this thing, you know, back together and back from the brink, that one really needs to ask themselves, you know, what justice are we actually doing uh, in continuing down this road? But, but maybe that's a, a question for, for another day. Um, and you know, you know, notwithstanding that, you know, the NCIP can entirely undo or restart or redraft many sections themselves. So one, I think, needs to keep in the back of their mind: is it not good to rather put something that is more clear, more concise, more well drafted uh, than than where we are um, at, at the moment? Um, and 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 just I mean I don't have the, the the presentation in front of me, but when I was trying to sort of you know go through it, and, and always the problem is when you're dealing with things as complex as this, you're just trying to sort of you know keep up as best as you can. But it it appeared to me that you know that there was uh, comments on 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 items that that weren't advertised, um, and that uh, and that consideration was taken. You know, on comments which were beyond the call for for comments. So I just like the advocate just to just to have a look at that. Where, in, in fact, if that did happen, and if it did, if she could just uh, comment uh, on on that particular part. Um, and and I would just like to get an indication from uh, Advocate Fanimova, you know, when she says you know that they're still doing research. Um, and so on, on on parts of the bill. I mean, to what extent, you know, is more information and more research still required? Um, because, you know, I think that that needs to indicate to us, you know, what is still incomplete. And I think that that may uh, or may not um, uh, sort of speak to the to the last point that the Honourable Mbiani was making. So, you know, it's, I mean, this is something that has dragged on for years. Uh, and I think at some point, Chair, we need to have a discussion about, you know, you know, how desirable is this process that we've embarked on? Um, and, 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 and is it the correct process and the correct road that we're still on? But as I said, maybe that's a discussion for another day. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, McPherson. Uh, can I hand back to um, Dr. Masocha and Advocate Fandameva? Oh, I see Honorable Mulder, your hand. 
Thank you, Honourable Chair. Um, just a short question. Um, I, I agree and concur with what Honourable McPherson said. Um, I don't know if I've actually missed it, but um, there is a uh, constitutional court case um, set out for the 12th, I think. I just wanted to check here. Um, the uh, blind versus minister of the uh, blind SA. This is the Minister of Trade. I don't know if Advocate from Amaba is, is aware of that and whether she could actually give us more information on that about the constitutional case coming up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Mulder, Advocate van der Merwe. Thank you, Chair Person, and thank you to the members. Um, I'll try my best to, to answer all the, the questions um, asked. Um, if I may, be, may start with, with language, um, when it comes to legislation, it, it is a very, very important issue. And even a comma or, or you know, a comma in the wrong place may make a big difference in, in what happens in practice in, in that legislation. So it is, it, is, it is unfortunately a very, in itself, it is a very complex issue uh, to, to develop legislation. And we do try and simplify it as much as possible. And the language that we use, um, and, and I'll, I'll get to, to the difference between fair, fair use, fair dealing, fair practice. You know, these things are actually quite plain language that's out there, but because of the history of, of intellectual property, it becomes weighted words. Um, and, and it's very difficult to, to move away from that because if you move away from that, in law, you are then, um, so if you change the, a, a word, for instance, you are actually by implication saying that you are no longer accepting the previous meanings, you are now creating something new. So, so it's very, very complex, it's very difficult, but I do assure members, we do try and word things as, as clear and simple as possible. In fact, some of the proposals that we made were to make it a bit more clear because it, it was um, you know, it could have been interpreted one way or the other, um, and it was a bit vague. So, so we really, we really do try and and do that. Um, in respect of maybe just quickly, uh, in in respect of of an updated um, socioeconomic impact assessment, um, legislative process does not require any further socioeconomic impact assessments to be done. Um, but like I said when I started, if the committee is concerned. The committee can ask for an opinion or a form of impact assessment or a full impact assessment. That is always possible, but normally um, in normal, you know, just legislative development, uh, this is done by public consultation, which has happened. Um, in respect of that issue of extent versus extend, um, if, if please, if the member could, could point that out to us so that we can correct it and make sure um, that we actually get that. Um, Chair, could I... Could I, sorry, I'm, I'm, my apologies. Uh, just on that, I've, I found it. Um, it is um, the section 12D9 uh, moved here from 12B1B, uh, delete to the extent practical, and then uh, within its recommendation in respect of retaining to the extent that is practical, it should be to the extent with the T. I think you correctly said it's important that we get language in terms of legalese. Thank you, Chair. And my apologies for interrupting. Thank you. I've made a note of that and we'll definitely see to that that, that is corrected. Um, in respect of uh, maybe uh, on, on just more work having to go into the bill, I will also, um, when I'm done, just, just uh, with your permission, Chair, hand over to, to DTI, uh, to, to Dr. Masocha, just to, to speak to that. Um, the, the issue that we have here is it is a it is a fair use, and, and I can maybe also also <laughs> combine all my my, my answers in, in one. Uh, fair use is is a new policy direction for copyright. The current uh, regime is one of fair dealing, so one needs to be very cautious um, when you do this because it, things will now work differently. Once this bill has has been assented to and put into operation, things will happen differently. It, it is a fact. Um, 
so, so there, there needs to be there needs to be caution. Um, sometimes things might come up during discussions, even questions that are raised, um, and there might be things that that when in my presentation I might have put in in one way, the department considered it in a different way. So, so it, it's it's to clear these things up. I'm not saying that there, there's a, a lot of of work that still needs to be done. What I'm trying to say is, is that we are definitely still trying to get stuff together and make sure that we give the committee the the, the best possible um, advice. Um, but I think uh, Dr. Masocha can 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 also add to that. Um, so, so it's not so much backtracking. It's more to um, to make sure that that we what we advise the committee, um, you know, at, at the moment, for instance, on on, on technological protection measures, ju just to give that as an example, what the committee currently has before it is a question of do we close all the loopholes? Um, because if we do close all the loopholes, we might have the consequence where consumers are not allowed to take their vehicle to any garage for repairs. They will have to take it back to the dealer. So there's there's an impact versus do we allow um, more freedom on technological protection measures um, and then risk uh, not getting the technology? It's, it's complex, it's, it's not an easy answer, but that is the question that's before the committee now. So the committee will need more information and that is what we will try and do our best to get to the committee so that there's more clarity, more information to make better decisions. So that is that is what I mean with, with that. Um, the question on sales versus material amendments, um, maybe just to quickly reiterate, the sales is only a cabinet formal requirement. There is no other requirement that formally requires a sales to be done in order for a bill to be passed in a constitutionally acceptable manner. That's what I mean with that. So in respect of when you do further amendments, when we go to the public, we ask the public, this is what we propose, what do you say? And the public will then come back to us and say, no, 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 you can't do this because this will be the impact. Or yes, please, this is the impact that we want. And then the committee can consider that. But if the committee is not clear and the committee is uncertain, the committee can ask further opinions, can ask for impact assessment. All of those things are possible for the committee to do. So that is what I, what I mean with that. All the fears, coming to all the fears. Um, I agree. There's, there's, it's, it's a bit mind blowing. All these, these, these things that we use in, in this, and, and again, coming back to plain language usage. You know, because of intellectual property being such a complex area, the, the words that have been used in the past and the words that are used globally, it is just better to use the same words to, to avoid confusion. But. When it comes to the fares, fair use and fair dealing are two different systems. So fair dealing has a list of exceptions that are acceptable. Fair use gives principles. So, so you don't give specific exceptions, but you give a, a test. So if, you're, if, you, if the action that you did complies with the four principles of the test, it is fair use. If it doesn't, it wasn't fair use and you've infringed copyright. Fair dealing, if you've done something that's not in the list, you have infringed copyright. So that is that is the two systems. What the bill has is fair use, which gives you the principles, as well as specific exceptions. That's why we say it is hybrid. So, so that's where fair use and fair dealing comes in. Now, fair practice is, is something very different. Fair practice almost is one of these uh, criteria that we can we can slot in under fair use. If you, what you've done here accords with fair practice, in other words, what if, if I'm in, 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 in a library, I work in a library, I've made a copy for a student of two pages. Um, if other libraries also make two, two page copies for, for, for students of other books, um, and I've got maybe seven countries where this is the, the case, then we can say, but this is fair practice. This is done everywhere. We have examples of this being done. It's not something new. So, so it slots in under fair use. Um, and, and it's one of the, the principles that, that we can look at. Um, in respect of importing the provisions, so, so that aspect of, of the 30 days and, and the 60 days, I think there were some comments on whether it's long enough, not long enough. The proposal that we make is to not use this wording at all and rather revert back to what the bill was saying before. Um, 
because especially with this respect to the 30 days, there needs to be an official archive, which South Africa doesn't have. So it just it just, just wouldn't make sense. It, whether it's 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, there isn't an archive. We, we, we cannot archive. Um, so so the, the proposal is to, to, at this point in time, not use the Canadian Act's wording. And then the question on why do we use the Canadian Act's wording? Well, to some extent, it does help to look at other countries and see what they do and what works, um, because then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. But I do agree, we need to be cautious because the, the circumstances in Canada are not the same as the circumstances in, in South Africa. And um, that, that is what we need, we need to consider. And, and it's, it's exactly because of that, that we say, uh, we recommend that we rather not use the Canadian wording um, now, whether adjusted or not adjusted, uh, rather revert to the bill um, before the, the act first. Um, the, the question on whether we are still in line with the reservations, yes, we are. What happened with, with this bill is that a lot of clauses were in fact opened because of the reservation in respect of public consultation and the reservation in respect of compliance with the treaties. So because of that, we, are, we, 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 we made a number of, of amendments have been, been made so far, proposed so far, but we have also, there is a document somewhere, if, if necessary, I can find it and, and, and send it again to the secretary, where we listed all the amendments and we indicated where they came from, whether it was in, in respect of a treaty. Uh, in fact, it was in the wording, was the wording document. There's, there's a document that has all the wording and, and footnotes to say where it comes from, whether it was from public comments, from the treaties, uh, constitutionality. Um, the issue of wireless versus wire, the, the concern was that on the one hand, there, there were people saying on broadcast, the definition is outdated, you shouldn't have wire, and that is why, why wire was taken out. But then the comments that came in now was, yes, it's outdated, but there is still wire in South Africa when, when, when we broadcast. Some, some organizations use wire. So by taking that out, you are excluding them from copyright, and that is uh, from, from using copyrighted material, sorry. Um, so that is why the proposal was for, for that to, to be brought back in. Um, then I spoke just to, to, to technical language versus simple language. And like I say, we really do try. It is a bit difficult because of the, the meaning that is given to phrases in intellectual property globally. But we do, we do try and do that. The constitutionality of the bill. Um, I'm not sure when the member joined this committee, but I did an opinion um, at the outset of this process, the Section 79 process. Our office is of the view that the bill is constitutional. And the, the committee then decided, and, and but what we did advise is, is if the committee decides to err on the side of caution and actually advertise the bill for comments, we can further consider constitutionality issues that were raised. We did so, and we are still satisfied that the bill is constitutional. There were one or two proposals now that were made, and we did raise a concern. For instance, strict liability um, on, on an offence. Um, I, I am concerned that I don't think that will pass constitutional muster. So at this point in time, if there is any amendment that comes through, if we have a concern with it, we will definitely raise it with the committee. And yes, we have considered every issue that was raised by the public in respect of constitutionality. Um, then the, the aspects um, on Mr. McPherson in respect of whether we, we considered comments on items not advertised, what we did was to consider every single submission that came in. And a number of submissions dealt with issues by, um, very, very going very far back um, uh, in respect of, for instance, whether it should be fair use versus fair dealing. Um, there, there were comments on um, the retrospectivity of clauses. But every single word and every single submission was, in fact, considered. So uh, what we then advised the committee on was in respect of the most recent amendments. So decisions that have been taken a long time ago, we did not go back to those. But the most recent amendments, um, even if they weren't advertised, we did advise the committee on those um, simply to give effect to, to public consultation. It's, it's, not, it's not ideal, and the committee needs to stop consulting at some point. Um, but it's also a difficulty that we sit with that the public has given us this input um, and, and what do we do with it. So, so it was it was difficult. Um, I think I've already spoken to, to research and, 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 the, and, and I'll, I'll ask the, the, um, Dr. Masocha to speak a bit more to that. 
Then just lastly, the case of blind SA, yes, in fact, the, the case of blind SA deals with disability. It deals with the Copyright Act, doesn't deal with this bill. We need to keep that in mind. It's very important. Um, the Copyright Act, without this bill, does not make sufficient provision for the blind to have accessible formats, um, to make copies of, of a work in an accessible format. And, and that is the whole issue of, of the blind SA case. It is being heard by the Constitutional Court on the 12th, and um, we hope to get that judgment quite soon. And of course, we will we'll brief the committee on that on that judgment if um, that comes through before the committee is finished uh, with this bill. Um, I think it's, it's, it's very important for the committee to note that the Constitutional Court is not um, considering the bill that is before this committee. Um, I believe that that some of the wording of the bill is is um, proposed to the to the um, Constitutional Court. Um, and the, the Constitutional Court may pronounce on that wording, but that is not in respect of this of this bill. Um, so if there is something that needs to be added, um, it is something, it is, all, all, of course, also for the committee to, to say, well, you know, um, let's maybe see what, what happens with that before we make a final decision on this bill. That's a possibility. The committee can also say, well, we need to finish our process. We don't know when the Constitutional Court is going to give that judgment. Um, and then we will advise the NCOP committee of, of anything that needs to be added. Um, but like I said, it doesn't necessarily halt the process in this committee. It will be for this committee to decide to, to do so or not. Um, and it's only in respect of the wording in respect of, of dis disability. And as far as I'm aware, um, the is, uh, blind SA is, is satisfied with the wording um, in 19D, um, especially the ones before advertising and, and in line with our recommendations. Thank you, Chair. If I may, if I may then hand over to uh, Dr. Masocha just to specifically speak to, to the issue of further work that's required, and then of course anything else that, that she, she needs to address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Advocate. Um, Dr. Masocha? Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. In terms of the, the work that still needs to be undertaken, because of the areas where we have uh, differences um, that still needs to be ironed out to give one advice to the committee, um, based on the advice that has been provided from the public participation process, we are of the view that we need to ensure that there is thoroughness that is applied and that we are consistent and also in line with the, the um, other implications from case law, uh, from the treaties, and, and so on. So when we say research, as advocate has indicated, we are not talking about um, outsourcing uh, research, like um, having um, someone doing the research for us. We, we will be looking at um, the experts, uh, expert advices that have been provided, including the um, the, 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 the various issues raised by the experts in the submissions that have raised the unintended consequences. We need to look at those unintended consequences to, to balance them out, to see how best to advise with a way forward. Advocate gave an example about the technological protection measures. Because we have um, uh, different views from parliament and from the department on the approaches they there is a need to ensure that when we come and say this is uh, these are the options available, they have been thoroughly assessed. And this is because of the process of the public participation, uh, the guidance that has been received and other work that is already underway that has been done previously and the different advices that is available. So we don't foresee that in terms of timelines, it's going to take uh, very long. Uh, we think that uh, as early as next week, we could be having some positions um, on the areas that we are having some um, differences, including the one on the offenses, uh, on the commercial versus non-commercial implications. Uh, so we will be looking at those and, and to make sure that we come back to the committee with thorough um, advice. So um, the research um, aspect is more about just assessing implications, weighing out the options, and ensuring that when we then say, um, this is what we think should be the way forward, it's something that has been thoroughly uh, considered, but it's not something that we think will should, should drag out the process in terms of time. 
So we could come back uh, next next week, uh, Chair and Honourable Members, with um, responses to those those areas. I think I she has already talked to the research and, and the, um, the 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 issues around that. So that's the that's the context where we are coming from. We think that instead of just saying um, DDIC's view is this or Parliament's view is that the committee must decide, we think that we should just outline the issues more thoroughly and put them out so that you can be able to assess. Um, the best way forward. And that requires putting together some additional information because we did receive more input from the public participation process. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Masocha. I have a request from uh, Honorable McPherson to have a follow-up question. Honorable McPherson. Sorry, thank, thanks so much, Chair, for just... Uh, uh, entertaining uh, my, my follow-up, and, and I must apologize if I've missed it, but can the DDG just please point me to where uh, the publication uh, of the CS uh, was since 2015? I may have missed it, uh, and, and if it was published or provided to the committee, if that can just be made available to me, again, I'd be grateful. Thanks. Thank you, Honorable McPherson, DDG, Dr. Masocha. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, McPherson, for that for that uh, comment. There was a there was CS there was a CS done um, the the one that the, the advocate referred to the DPME uh, CS that has to be done for the cabinet processes. But we did have a re regulatory impact assessment study as well. Uh, that was conducted, and they were submitted to the portfolio committee. Uh, I think it, it was in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. So what we will do, uh, we will uh, avail those documents again, uh, Honourable Ch uh, Chair and uh, Honourable McPherson, to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that um, concludes our deliberations on the remitted bills for today. And just a reminder that we will be, we still have quite a few slots as the committee to, to further deliberate on, on, on these remitted bills. So thank you very much to Advocate Van der Merwe for the presentation and to Dr. Masocha for her inputs and for all the inputs from, uh, from members of the portfolio committee. Um, as we say, the struggle continues, so we will be having further engagements on the remitted bills. I think we'll now move to the next uh, uh, agenda item, which is the formal uh, consideration of the budget vote report. And I think, can I hand over to, to Ms. Matomela on behalf of the department? Um, chair, if I may, Chair? Yes. It's a committee process, Chair. It's we really leading the discussion, Ms. Oh, okay. Matomela. It's only if there's any questions. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that, yes. <laughs> no problem, Chair. Chair, okay. if I may, we have we've distributed the report to all to all members. Members we have the members have looked at the report last week and an updated version was ordered to members. Members also had opportunity to submit additional concluding remarks or recommendations to, to, to consider. We did not receive any. So the report is before the committee for consideration and adoption, Chairperson. Um, Chairperson, I don't know, do not know if you want us to just to go through the conclusions again or anything like that, but we have done it more than once, Chair. Nothing has subsequently changed. If, if there was any changes, it was purely grammatical and, and, and basic editing process that happened, but nothing of substance changed that we have to bring to the committee's attention, Chair. The only addition, Chair, was yeah. the introduction that we that we added and we distributed for members for their for their for, for them to, to to read through it. That was the only substantive addition um, that was made to the report. I think then um seeing that we have been through the con to, to the conclusion and cl conclusions and there were no um not no further inputs, can I ask then that we have the the um the introduction just read into the into the minutes. I know you have circulated the introduction. Chair, we can certainly do that, Chair, if Marco just 
Um, um, Sorry, I, I, I see this hand from Honorable Mbuyani. Honorable Mbuyani. No, thank you very much, Chairperson. I think you read my mind. I wanted uh, the introduction to be reflected so that we, uh, we go through it, to integrate it into the broader report, then we adopt it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Mbuyani. Uh, Secretary? My apologies, Chair. Um, I'll read it into the minutes. Um, in the State of the Nation Address in February 2022, the President emphasized the need to build on initiatives of economic reconstruction and recovery and to improve the business environment for all companies by reducing red tech across all spheres of government. The key priorities for the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition in this regard is to contribute to growing the economy, consequently creating jobs and reducing poverty and inequality. This will be done by one, attracting and retaining investment, two, facilitating increased lo localization, and three, increasing exports for supporting regional integration, particularly capitalizing on opportunities brought by the African continental free trade area. The sectorial plans, localization, and beneficiation, special industrial development, regional integration, promotion of global trade, and creation of a conducive business environment are some of the mechanisms that the DTIC plans to implement. There will also be a program to reduce red tape across the DTRC and its entities in support of the presidency's initiatives. The DTIC's 2022-23 annual performance plan pulls joint key performance indicators introduced in 2021 to improve integration of the work of the DTIC and its entities. Three succinct outcomes are introduced, namely one, industrialization to promote jobs and rising incomes, two, transformation to build an inclusive economy, and three, a capable state to ensure improved impact of public policies. Each program's key performance indicators are therefore linked to one of these three outcomes. outcomes. The DTRC allocated budget remains under pressure due to fiscal constraints and a slow economic recovery. However, the three outcomes are expected to focus its activities and ensure that non-financial policy tools and support measures across the DTRC are used effectively to maximize its impact. Furthermore, the DTRC will continue to leverage the balance sheets of the development finance institution to expand off-budget financing opportunities and to increase resource efficiency. Thank you very much. That's the introduction. Um, can I take it that um, it has been circulated to members that there is no objection to anything that's been captured in the in the introduction? We agree. I don't see any hands. Thank you very much. So um, into the conclusions. We take it that um, the committee has agreed to that. Honorable Mbuyani. Chairperson, thanks once again for the opportunity. I propose that as the introduction has been read and the conclusion has been dealt with on the last meeting, I, pro I propose that we formally adopt this report as a committee report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Mbuyani. Can I have a seconder for that proposal for the adoption of the report? Honorable Moatse. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I second the adoption of the report. Thank you very much. So the re report is duly adopted by the uh, committee. Oh, sorry, Chair, I was just Chair, trying Chair. to direct myself to you. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> yes, you yes, please note the abstention of the DA. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is noted. Any other abstentions or? Honourable Chair. Yes, Honourable Thank you for the opportunity. Please note the abstention of the Freedom Front Plus as well. Thank you very much. 
So we've noted those abstentions by the Democratic Alliance and the Freedom Front Plus. Um, we have noted, Honorable Hello, Chair. Yes, uh, please also note the uh, abstaining of the of the EEFF. And the ab abstention of the EFF. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. As, yes, as, well, <clears throat> as well as the AC, as well as the ACDP abstention. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Committee Secretary. We will record the abstentions in the report, Chair, and the report will be published in the ATC. Hopefully either today or tomorrow for the latest chair. Okay. Um, right. Can we deal with the next agenda item? Chair, the next agenda item is consideration of minutes, Chair. Um, the first set of minutes that we will flight is the minutes for um, the 19th, the 29th of March, Chair. That was the last meeting for last quarter, Chair. Um, if we can just take the members through the minutes. Jim, there was the ANC Delhi, um, 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 delegation was all in attendance, Chair. If we go down, we have an apology from Mr. McPherson and Mr. Thring for that meeting, Chair. If we go down. Chair, we considered the committee second quarter report, Chair. Um, um, if we go down, Margo. And also we consider the oversight program that was drafted and that the committee implemented during the period in April, Chair. We also considered draft minutes of the 16th and the 22nd of March, Chair, and 23rd of March. And the meeting adjourned until the 19th of April, Chair. Thank you very much. So there we have it, uh, committee members. Can I have a mover and a seconder that this is a true reflection of our deliberations on that day? Thank you, Honorable Motau. Thanks, Chair. I move for adoption of the minutes. Thank you, Honorable Moase. Thank you, Chairperson, seconded. Thank you very much. The minutes are adopted. Next set of minutes. Chair, the next set of minutes will be the 19th of April, Chair. Um, it was on the TTIC campus and we had a hybrid meeting, Chair. Um, we, we had a briefing by the TTIC on the strategic and annual performance plans, Chair. Um, go down, Chair. And then also, we had an apology from Mr. McPherson and Mr. Mulder who was not able to attend. She then we had this briefing led by the minister um, and the acting DG, Ms. Mabichu Thompson, and Mr. Khan, on the sub on the annual performance plan and strategic plan. And the committee deliberated. The digital report was just adopted by the committee. Um, and the issues that uh, the resolutions is in relation to to that report that was just adopted by the committee. The meeting adjourned until the Tuesday, the third of May. Chair. Thank you very much. Can I have an indication of the adoption of the minutes of the nineteenth of April? I see the hand of Honourable Motau. Thanks, Chair. I move for adoption of the minutes. Honorable Moatsi. Thank you, Chairperson. I second the move. Thank you very much. So we have adopted the minutes for the 19th of April. Next set of minutes. The next set of minutes is dated the 3rd of March, 3rd of May, my apologies. And we received the briefing by the DTIC on the status of special economic zones. Chief, we go down. Were there no apologies? You went a bit fast there. I'll just go up. I think all, all were in oh, attendance. Everyone was present. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Chair, then the um, um, Deputy Minister Kina with Mr. Molofani and, and Deputy Minister Majola 
led the discussion and the briefing on the SSS and its actual box, and the issues are captured that was raised by the committee. Um, if Chair, if we go down. It's quite a substantive number of issues, and the committee resolved that it must TTCM must submit outstanding questions to the committee within seven days, and also invite the committee to observe certain meetings that are conducted with the SCZ steering committees in various provinces, and they would meet at 11 on the 4th of May to allow the secretary to finalize inputs from parties on the conclusions and the recommendation for the budget vote report. Meeting adjourned until the 4th of May, Chair. Thank you very much. Can I have a move and a second for the adoption of the minutes of the 3rd of May as tabled? Honorable Moatse. Thank you, Chairperson. I move for adoption of the certain minutes as true reflection. Thank you very much. Honorable Mbiani. Chairperson, thanks. Uh, I second the, the proposal made. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the minutes of the 3rd of May. So we have the last set of minutes of the 4th of May. The last set of minutes was the consideration of the first draft of the budget vote report, Chair. If we go down. You have apologies, Mr. Cuthbert, Mr. Mulder, Mr. Swaku, Chair. We go down. Chair, we submitted the first draft of the report, Chair, and we re we also requested um, um, parties to submit concluding remarks to be considered, and the ANC submitted the concluding remarks, which is captured in the, in the minutes, Chair. If we go down. Then, Chair, we, with, we, we committed to resolve with regard to point five. There were certain amendments um, 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 proposed and agreed to, and the request that members submit the report to the respective caucuses for input before it's formally considered today. And the meeting adjourned until the 6th of May, Chair. Thank you very much. Can we have mover and seconder for the adoption of the minutes of the 4th of May as tabled? Ms. Moatse, Chair. Honorable Moatse. Chairperson, I move for adoption of the minutes. Thank you, Honorable Moatse. Um, Honorable Malamecha, Mala, Mala Malamacha, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Malamacha. Mala I, I second. Thank you. <laughs> I second the move. Thank you very much. So the minutes are then duly adopted. Uh, that concludes the minutes. Um, in conclusion, then, uh, on um, committee secretary, uh, we I see there is a proposed change to our, our meeting for a Friday, the 11th of May. Uh, secretary, can you just speak to that uh, change? Chair, given the nature of the discussion and given the fact that there are some matters that requires further consultation between the DTRC and the other Kandamaro in preparation for further deliberation, there was a request that we, we postpone the meeting for Friday that would allow the department and Advocate Kandamaro to come to a to come to common ground and allow them the time to do so by not having the meeting on Friday, so that our next meeting will be on Tuesday, um, the 17th. I'm just the Tuesday, yes, the 17th. The 17th, yes. yeah. That's a decision that the committee must take if they would uh, adhere to, or uh, accede to that request from the department and at the under matter of the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, is there anybody who objects to that? Postponement, I think, um, given our deliberations today, as said by the secretary, I think we need to give um, the advocate and the department a, a chance to do some more work. Honorable Mbuyani. Thanks very much, uh, Chairperson. 
I think as uh, alluded to in this meeting, to say we, we need to give the department and advocate Van der Merve for more research in, the, in, the, in this report so that when we deal with the bill, we deal with conclusively and uh, well informed. I propose that we can be able to give them the space uh, so that when we come on, on, on Tuesday, they will have made their recommendation and also their research on this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can we have a seconder for that? Although I think that we all agree to that proposal, but just for procedure's sake, uh, Honorable Mr. Malamacha, Chair. Malamacha. Thank you. I stand, I stand to second the whip that indeed we have to go and come with facts and everything so that when we deal with this matter, including the time frame of everything that has been said. You cannot have a matter that is coming for more than five years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Committee Secretary, can I just check that we are then saying that we move the other agenda items also to Tuesday, which is the NRC uh, chairperson. Um, report that is being sent back I to think the committee. We, we, we can do that, Chair, if that's, that, that's a decision of the committee, Chair. Yeah, okay. So that means we then uh, won't have a meeting of the PC on Friday. That's correct, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our business for today. Thank you to all the stakeholders and members of the public and uh, the department, um, our legal team and honorable uh, members who were present in the meeting today for your deliberations. Thank you very much. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye, Chair. Bye. Long live the chairperson. Long live, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Andre, do we meet on the same link? Oh, chair, um, I, can, I think we may need to meet later, Chair, because okay, we only will have a response more or less by one around Recording one. Recording stopped. I think, okay. So I think we will then send a new link, Chair. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Just, get, just bear in mind, I go into section 194 at two. At two, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No, okay. and I'm awake. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. Okay, bye-bye.